If you're in the adult class, please turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up around verse 20. Romans 8 and verse number 20. Yes. Oh, showcasing my Raider hat. There's a time for it. <laughs> verse number 20. Oh, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer first. Our most gracious and Heavenly Father, we come to you, Heavenly Father, thanking you for giving us this time, Heavenly Father. Guide us as we work our way through your wonderful book of Romans. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Verse 20, it says, for the creature was made subject to vanity. What, what is this creature? Is your dog, cat? What is this creature? Daryl. Actually, the creature is mankind. In other words, us. Were we made subject to vanity? Yeah, if you don't, if you don't think so, read any, any of Solomon's books. It says vanity, vanity, all is vanity. That's what pulls us away. When we're, we're tempted through vanity, which leads to our lust. It said, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What is that talking about? You ever seen a, uh, the first part of a movie and the hero is like, man, how are they going to get out of this? And then you eventually make it to the end of the movie and it's like, oh, okay, I see how somebody came and saved them. That's kind of our story as Christians too. When you look at us outside of Christ, and read about uh, read about God's creation in the Old Testament. And you, you see the Ten Commandments and everything. It's like, wow, wow, wow. Well, how, how can a man be saved? Man? And then guess who came on the scene? Jesus the Christ. It lets us know no matter what, we can find a way to be saved through Christ. So all is not lost. The Bible continues in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What is that talking about? It's a lot of figurative language here. I remember one time I taught a class about how we're only saved through the blood of Christ. And if you think about it, natural question should come up. It's like, what about how faithful Abraham was? You mean he didn't make it? Or what about John the Baptist? That's a that's a that's a very accurate question, isn't it? So how could all of them have been saved through the blood of Christ? Because contrary to popular belief, what's taught, people teach you're a good person, you die, you go right to heaven. It's not in the Bible. We go to the Hadean world. And if you're saved, you go on the place of comfort. If you're not saved, you go on the place of torment. And the wild thing is, when you read Luke 16, you can see a cross. Imagine that. You know where you're going when you go down there. But when Christ was crucified, it allowed his blood to take to take care of those that were in the place of comfort. A lot of people say, well, Christ came well after them. Yeah, but his blood covers eternity. It's just that people are willing to say that's what the groanings got. The groanings are not meant to be a negative thing. It's just they know there's a great anticipation. I mean, we're, I mean, after all, we're living in the Christmas season, right? You ever seen a kid at 11.55 knowing that he's got something under the tree? You think he's going to sleep, Brother Hart? He's going to rock and sing. We're getting to stay awake. Five more minutes and I can tear them, tear them, and give some. That's an anticipation. That's what it was before Christ. And we don't have to worry about that now because Christ's blood is flown. I tell people that's the biggest difference between because there is also another false teaching that John the Baptist's baptism was the same as Christ Jesus. Oh, no, sir, no, ma'am. Bible doesn't squat. I don't know how they get that person. And I've seen Church of Christ people teach that. The ultimate thing is before Christ died, John the Baptist's baptism 
allowed you to look forward to the blood of Christ. It prepared you as a baptism unto repentance. But when Christ spilled his blood, you still had to be rebaptized. Re if, if you were baptized for John the Baptist, you look to the blood of the cross. If you're baptized now, your sins go back to the cross. One is forward seeking, one goes back. Don't let anybody fool you on that. Don't say, well, I'm accepting John's baptism. You're gonna, and that's the only baptism in the Bible where you had to be rebaptized. So what was the purpose of the rebaptized? I remember talking to a person who I'll come right to you, David. I remember talking to a person who was real learned. You know what his comment was? He says there just had to be something else. Well, what was that? I don't know. It had to be something else. It's like, do you realize you're creating an issue that's not there? This is a well-learned man. He felt they were both the same. Then why were they rebaptized? Had to have been for another issue. Well, it's not spelled out in the scripture. Mm, David, go ahead, buddy. Baptism unto repentance. That's exactly right. The scripture that lets us know that after they were taught and baptized again, then they received the Holy Spirit. They didn't have it before that. Not at all. So it's a shame for that to be taught. I understand what the world or denomination would teach. They'll just find one scripture and teach all day long on something false. But that should not be taught in the church because we have no scripture authority. If I tell you anything, absolutely, you should say, Brother Nelson, that sounds Where's the scripture? And this person said there had to have been something else. No, you you have to be wrong then. That's what it is. It, 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 it hurt my heart because this person influences so many people. And it's like, they're not the same Baptist. And then guess where it ultimately ended? Well, thank God we ain't got to worry about that today. Yeah, but you're teaching something false. How do you know that's not going to mislead somebody? He says, we ain't got to worry about John's baptism today. But then why don't you teach just the baptism that Christ did of remission of sin you added to the church? That's what the Bible teaches for us today. Ephesians lets us know for there is but one baptism. Then what is that? John's and Jesus's? No. And if you're, if you're careful, you're putting uh, John the Baptist on the same plateau as Jesus. John himself said, I'm not worthy to unloose the latchets of his son. I've come to help prepare the way for him. Not the same baptism. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, you know what John said? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Those are powerful statements. You can't mix the two. Mm, questions, comments about what we covered? Yes, ma'am. Good to see y'all, by the way. Place of comfort. Yes, also called Abraham's bosom. Yes, read Luke 16, the entire chapter, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It gives you exactly what happens. And it's not a parable. It's a legitimate story. But it tells you what happens after death. Because the rich man who was who was over on the on the the, uh, the place of torment asked Lazarus if he could dip his tongue, and give him some water, so he could put it on his tongue. Yeah, it wasn't just those two that seen. It's a place they call it a place of conscious souls. You're totally aware of what's going on, and he even asked if he could send some people, some prophets, back to speak to his kid. Mm hmm. He told them they have the prophets. If they don't listen, it's a consequence. Isn't it something now he was being evangelized to when he was on this side of life? He don't want to hear it. Now he's at a place where he realized, oh, I know where I'm going. Now he wants to evangelize. Isn't that something? That's why we have to take heed to the blessings we have right now through this word. Because one day we're going to realize that, oh, man, praise God, the Church of Christ was right. Or, uh-oh, 
Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. And that means some will knee will bow and confess as they enter life eternal. Other people will realize the consequence of not accepting it when God gave them the time. The Bible makes it clear. All we do is promote what the Bible says. We're not trying to beat people over the head. But when you look at this world, this world is heading right to hell. It's some horrible stuff going on. And we have to make sure we have the right kind of, who in here has some kind of insurance? Usually you have some car insurance. You have house insurance. You have a, a health insurance. But what about insurance for eternity? Based upon what I, what, what I believe, I have the insurance where if I walk outside and get shot, at least I know where I'm going. The Bible says these things are written that ye may know. And we can show people, well, I've done, I've done the full plan of salvation. I'm living faithful to my wife, everything. So I'm set to go to heaven. We're going to read about something called predestination in the same chapter. I was going to, I wanted to save it for that. But that's the insurance people just skip right over. And all it costs you is obedience. On that, but you all, health insurance is crazy expensive. Pay all that, then you can't. My wife and I, a couple of years ago, had insurance on our house. And we had an issue with the back wall with water coming in, so we filed a claim. They came out and said, this is legitimate. Don't go ahead and pay for it. Then we had an issue with some water getting in in the living room. They came out. They said both were legitimate. They dropped us right away because we filed two claims. I thought that's what insurance was for. But see, it's all about them making money. That insurance only goes so far away. But see, with Christ, the insurance for eternal life, there's no deductibles. There's no insurance adjuster to come out and say, well, no. You can read in here what you can accept. And it's lifelong as long as you're faithful. As long as you stay in the vehicle, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Does that make that answer your question? In the place of comfort. Mm -hmm. Re just, just read Luke 16. And then we'll pick back up with it. We don't have time to go through Luke 16 tonight. But read Luke's, Luke 16. And remember, it's a place of conscious souls. There's a great gulf, a chasm it's called, that's between the two. But you can see a cross. You can see a cross. Talk about a, that's why it's called hell too. The Hadean world is also called Hades. You know, we often use the word hell loosely. Like, it's just a place. Hell can, when you look at the actual word, it can mean the grave. It can mean the holding place of conscious souls, which is the Hadean world. Or it can mean Gehenna, the lake of fire. All of those words are translated H-E-L-L. -L. We use that word very, very loosely. But while you're in the holding place, you can see a cross. Now, once people that aren't saved go to the lake of fire, Christians go to heaven. That's two totally different things. And one thing that's noted about the lake of fire hell, that God is not present anywhere. And that was made for Satan and his angels. That wasn't made for one, one man. But people have chosen through disobedience to follow that doctrine. And all I tell people, you can't blame God. He's given us the way. It's just what we, and he's given you free will. You can accept it or deny it. But understand there's consequences for both. If me and my wife said, we're going to go on a vacation for six months. Thomas, you got the house. Do you think I got to spell out everything that he doesn't have to do? It's like, I don't want you smoking no dope in this house. I don't want you drinking alcohol, throwing parties. I shouldn't have to say that. And if he doesn't, if we get back and the house is clean and everything is good, he took care of it, there's a consequence of I may take him somewhere and show my appreciation. But if I get back and girls naked up in the house, running around, he's sitting back smoking dope. There's going to be a negative consequence, too. But he had free will. Now, you know Thomas wouldn't do that, so I ain't gonna, I'm not going to throw him out there. But understand, there's a consequence for every decision. We try to teach kids that. Yes, Sister one. Oh, Gail.
I can only say what the Bible says. The Bible says it's a place of conscious souls when you go to degree and you can see through. Now, is that saying that your best friend who's not saved is sitting there burning? You can see that? I don't know. Because remember, we're talking about a whole different plane. That's like somebody saying, what is heaven like? Can I really tell you what heaven is like? I can only tell you what the scriptures say, but there's no graphic details. We just know where my, my whole thing is. I'll come right to you, David. We just want to know where we want to be. I, I, I really don't care what heaven is like. God is there. That's where I want to be. If there's a place of, of, of torment and a place of comfort, comfort, I don't care how bad the, the, the torment is. I want to be on the comfort side. In my family as well, David. That's heaven. Yes. Yeah, but we, we, we thought, all, the, what we got to say is we got to say what the Bible says. The Bible lets us know that they could see a cross. Now, what they saw, how, the Bible didn't give anything. So I'm, I'm not going to try to make up or say, well, since it's in heaven, because the Hadean world is not heaven. You know, where, when, when Christ said to the thief who, was, who had a better mentality than the other one, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The denomination world would teach, see, that's why he went right to heaven. No, he didn't. He went to the Hadean world. Yeah. Now, it could be that what you see is not going to design to hurt you. I don't know. And quite frankly, I'm just concerned about getting there. If I get there and I see it, you think I'm still, a, I, you th I want to go over there. No. I want to be where God would want me to be. Follow me? That's why when the Bible says work out your own soul salvation, there are people that I pray. I have a best friend in California that's not saved. I want him to be saved so much, but I can't will him in that. Man. He has to accept it. So when we're sitting in the place of comfort and we can look over in the AD inside, everybody had their own opportunity to accept it. If they don't, what can I say? We can just pray for them and do all we can right now to help them out. But we can't, can't make an exception because we were close to them. Does that make sense? Some things are hard, and that's a hard one, but it's reality. God is not playing. His son, do, you, do, you, do we realize what Christ went through to create the opportunity? We can't play with that. And the Bible says he's a righteous judge, so he's going to judge fairly. You can rest on that. But make no mistake, he's, he's made the path clear. I remember, I'll share this with you, then we'll move on. When Steph and I was attending Sunset, and they were looking for, they were looking to hire a preacher, and one preacher came in and broke it down. And then he waited and asked questions. I mean, he opened the floor up for questions. And there was one lady who was a former Catholic, and I knew her personally, and I could tell it's like she still had a foot in, in on Catholicism and a foot in the Church of Christ. So I think she asked this question because she wanted to jam him up. She wanted to see what he was going to say. She said, Preacher, I got a question. You're familiar with, quote, unquote, Mother Teresa? And he said, yes. He says, are you telling me she went to hell? That's a heck of a question, isn't it? You know what the minister said? If she wasn't baptized for the remission of her sins, yes, she did. And he left it right there. Now, was that a cold response? I'll come right to you, Sharon. That wasn't cold. He said what the Bible says. See, people are caught up in, she did great works. I've seen the movie. But so did Cornelius. And Cornelius was a guilty distance from making it to heaven until he heard the words of Peter and got saved. See, we have to be careful when we get caught up in what is so nice or they do so many good things. That does, if that's the case, then Christ wouldn't have had to die. We can't skip over that. Sister Hart. Yes. Wow. You hear that, folks? That's nowhere in the Bible. You've all you've all heard of purgatory. It's a Catholic doctrine where people die and they're in a holding place. It's like saying they still got a chance if you pray. So what was the whole point of living right on this side of life then? 
you can just raise all kind of hell and then have somebody pray for you and you make it. See, that's man's doctrine. Purgatory is found nowhere in the Bible, not even indirectly. I've heard people try to use what we talk about in Luke 16 as purgatory. No, these people didn't have another. The way they went down is the way they're going to come up. You couldn't pray for somebody in the Hadean world and, okay, because they were bad, but now they're good. No. It's based on their life. And I, I don't know what's hard about that. That's more than fair to me. If we value what Christ did, it's going to affect our lives right now, not when we realize, uh-oh, I'm not in the right place. Well, what's all them flames? Ooh, I want another chance. No, that's what this side of life is for. Thank you, Shane. Anybody else? We okay? Right. You can always follow up with me after this, too. I mean, maybe we'll do a full lesson on Luke 16, too. It's, it's fascinating when you do the whole chapter. What do we leave off at now? Let's see. Verse 23. Thank you, David. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. What's this first fruits of the spirit? What is that part? What are the first fruits of the spirit? You see, you got to remember, this is still during the first century of the church. These were some of the original people to be saved, and that's why they're called first fruits. Gail. That wouldn't be involved with the Holy Spirit, though. This is with every Christian, but the early ones in the first century. That's why one of the, one of, you know, when I say the name of the, Church should be the Church of Christ. Then people try to pull out names in the Bible. Like, well, I remember one lady said, well, it says Church of First Fruits. You know what I was called? And I'll come right to you, Sister Van Gogh. The reason why it says Church of First Fruits is because that was the first century. Those were the first ones to take part. And we wouldn't be a part of Church of First Fruits because it's been many, many years. And there's a first fruit principle even found in the Old Testament. You know what that is? One we should use. You give God the first of everything you have. You know, when you get your check, is God the first one to receive anything? No, the federal government is, without your permission. That's a type of first fruit. But now you should already have set what you're going to give to God. That's our first fruit. It's given the first and best of what you have. Does that make sense? I saw Sister Vanco, you had your hand up. Yes. That's talking about the great anticipation of our redemption. Like, don't you sometimes think, you know, the people you want to be saved, but this world is so crazy. Ooh, it'd be good to make it to heaven. It's an anticipation. And the word groan is used there. We're going to see it a lot through Romans 8. It's even going to talk about when we when we're so overwhelmed with something and we're praying for it, the Bible says there's groanings for the Holy Spirit has to intercede and, and pray for us on behalf of God's will. That's how good we have it. Does that make sense, Sister Vanco? All right. What do we say here? The first, the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Are we saved right now? Yes, if you've obeyed the, if you've obeyed the gospel, you're saved. But have we been, and we say speak of redemption, you know, it's a continual process. Can we mess up and fall out of Christ before he comes? And we're, we're going we're gonna to read about that coming up in close to verse 30. So it's still a process. We're in the process of being saved. 
we're in the process of being redeemed. And there's great anticipation for man. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says a lot about heaven. But just think of God told you, and he told us this in his word. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither is even enter the heart of man. Those things which God has prepared for those who love him. Just let that sit, sit on your heart for a minute. Imagine a little kid at Christmas. Daddy, what you get me for Christmas? I got you everything you wanted and even better. How do you think that kid is going to how do you think that kid is going to feel? Well, I ain't going to sleep for 3 weeks. But I can't wait to see this. It's an anticipation. Then that's designed for us as like an incentive. It should make us want to live more and take hits for Christ. That's the that's the actual context. But see, if you don't study the word on a regular basis, it's hard to relate to. That. It's like, I know what the Bible says. But if you read and study it, it gets you excited. No man knows the day, but we know every time we wake up, every time I open up my eyes, I, I tell myself before I pray, one day closer. And it could be less than one day. But God has promised us that. The Bible says, Peter tells us, what man are we to be? He talks about the the the, uh, the heavens uh, rolling back and the elements melting with fervent heat. And he says, knowing that, what manner of man ought we to be? See, that lets us know we're at work. We're at. We don't have an excuse. God has told us what he's going to do. The question is, what are we going to do? It says, heaven and earth shall burn up, but my word will last forever. You know who else can last forever? A saved soul. And God has left that in our hands. Let's continue. Verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? I tell people, when we get to heaven, would there still be a need for hope and faith? Why not? And it's a simple answer. Because the, the people and the things that we hope for, we had faith in, were there with them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's why that was designed to be used down here. And be careful when you get caught up in saying, I can't quite figure this out or this, this doesn't make sense. That's why God gave us faith. People get caught up and I'll come right to you, Gail. People get caught up in these other books and it confuses them. And it's like, when God said he's not the author of confusion, that means you find your answers here. When you go outside of this, it's like, you ever seen people gamble? I mean, serious gamblers. It's like, I ain't got nothing but $7 left, but I'm going to let it ride. It's like, that's all you got? Mm-mm. That needs to be held. God has given us things that we have to use. Do you use your hope? And you know what our hope is? Don't mix hope with a wish. Wish has no basis. Our hope, the Bible says, is a lively. You know why? Because hope is supposed to be anchored to faith. And what is faith anchored to? The future in heaven. We accept that by faith because God said it in his word. Gail. Mm -hmm. Be not seen. That's exactly, you're, you're right on point with that. That's exactly what it is. The question is, do we use it? And I challenge people, you should use it in all the practical days of your life. Not just when you come to Sunday school or worship service. This is how we're supposed to live our lives. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. You want a great example of it. You remember when David was fighting Goliath? Read those uh, verses and I think 1 Samuel. He used faith in every verse going down. I have a sermon that I've done. Maybe I'll do it again here soon. Where I show where he used faith all through his life going there. And he was a little boy. Wasn't a grown man. You don't need 20 years to develop your faith. You just need to know who you believe in. 
and be fully persuaded of it, and then it's action. And then watch how it grows. It's a beautiful, easy process. First bell, right? right? Verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we have patience? Do we have patience? Wait for it. You want to find a precious word that the Bible talks about? It's patience. Why is patience so hard? And to me, it's harder for us today than those in the Old Testament in the first century. You know how this world has conditioned us? I love Gail calls it a microwave. Pull up and get fast food. If it ain't, if it ain't coming quick, we're upset. And rightfully so, because they say it's fast food. I remember Thomas had uh, helped me with a computer one time, and it was it was coming on. Thomas said, "That take too long. It's fast to me." I mean, he works in the in the computer area, but it's this world is set up for us to do things and want things quicker. So that patience is a challenge. But why is patience such a challenge? I'm gonna give you one example that hit me hard. I think about it quite often. We were living down south. Uh, this place where I worked at was called Bay Point Schools. It wasn't far from where we lived. I could go up, uh, I think that was Old Cutler too. And at that time, we just had Ricky. And he loved going to work with me when I could take him. He'd go in the office and sit at my desk and spin around in the chair. I remember one day I went in on Saturday. And we were driving home and we stopped at the corner of Old Cutler and Friend Hill. The light was red for us, so we sat there opposite. And then the light turned green. And I paused because I was getting something for him. And you know, as I paused, a big, it wasn't an 18-wheeler, but the cab park roared through. If I would have went, went right when it turned green, that truck would have tore into us on Ricky's side because it was sitting in front. I said, Lord, thank you for patience. To this day, I rarely pull out immediately on a green light. I'm pausing and I'm looking. And that one day, and that was well over 10 years. You've heard people say patience is a virtue. It is. Have you ever got mad at somebody and almost said something and held your tongue? Then later on you thought, man, I'm glad I didn't say that. So I didn't really mean it. We say many things out of anger that we don't really mean. I remember Gail shared me one time and a boss we both worked for, she had done something that was wrong. Gail had set up an email that blasted her. He didn't send it right away. He came back the next day and said, man, I'm glad I didn't send that, that email off. Patience is a part of Christ, Christianity. We have to wait patiently for Christ, don't we? Even when people are messing with us. Questions, comments about the importance of patience. You all see the necessity in patience? What did James say about it as we begin to close out? Go ahead, David. I was waiting for David to say something. Let, that's what, watch this, let patience have her perfect work. You got to look at some of those words. What does let imply? Allow. That's us to put ourselves second and let. And it says, let her have her what kind of work? Perfect. That word there translated complete. That's a blessing only for Christians. We have to try to apply that in everything. Yes, David. You know what I love about that, David? The last example I was going to give before we close out was anybody know what sprinting is? What is sprinting? SP, I don't mean the, the phone company. Speed, you're running fast, like a 100-meter dash. The race that Christians, the Christian race is, is designed to be like, it's a marathon. Now imagine if me and Brother Slocum went out there to the race and it's a marathon. We both got down. They said, go. Brother Slocum ran as hard as he could for the first 200 meters. What can you expect? After a while, he's probably going to stop. 
with the marathon, you have to pay. Uh, you have to pace yourself, which the same word patience comes from. You got to realize, well, I got this is just the first mile. I got 25.1 to go. So you can't go full speed. You got to pace yourself. That's the Christian race, and that's where patience plays in. We'll dig a little bit deeper than that, Lord's will, on Sunday. Thank you all for your attendance, your attention, and your patience. Let's close out in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you again, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be here, Heavenly Father, and tune in to your Bible study. Please bless us and allow us to be safe during this time where we have blessings to take time off and spend time with family and be on these busy roads. Take care of us, Father, as only you can. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Give you guys a <clears throat> brief lesson about Christian superheroes. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm a pretty big Marvel fan. And every superhero has two goals, to bring down the enemy and to save as many people as possible. As Christians, God, our captain, has given us a plan and we must execute it. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16, he says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. <clears throat> he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth shall not not shall be damned. So God has given us the plan to take down the enemy. And so our second goal is to save as many people as possible. I was uh, I was volunteering at a school and I met a firefighter. He was a chief for 27 years, former chief for 27 years, and he was telling me about all his experiences going to burning fires, burning buildings, earthquakes, things of that nature. And one of the stories he told me was that and he was in a burning fire and he was across from people that he couldn't save. And he's asking to pray with him. So as Christians, we cannot save everybody as superheroes. Superheroes can do everything in their power, save as many people as they want to or as they can. But as, unfortunately, we can't save everybody. And to deal with that, God says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. No matter how frustrating it may be to not be able to say the person that you want to, you can tell them anything that you want and they don't accept it. We have to just shake it off their feet and just keep going because we did everything in our power to save them. But it's their choice to want to believe it or not. So coming forth, if you haven't heard the word of God, to be saved, you must hear the word of God, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess of your sins, or confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized. So please come forward together, stand and sing.